In Chapter 24, we will cover the concepts of cellular metabolism. Metabolism is defined as all of the chemical reactions that occur in an organism. Cellular metabolism refers to the collective chemical reactions that occur within cells in order to provide the energy needed to maintain homeostasis and to perform essential functions. In order to study metabolism and energetics, we must refer back to the structure of ATP, which you can see here demonstrated in the slide. ATP is the energy source for our cells and it is used during metabolic reactions or it can be produced during metabolic reactions. Most metabolic reactions are going to be either catabolic or anabolic. Anabolic reactions are chemical reactions where compounds are synthesized. Catabolic reactions are chemical reactions where compounds are broken down. When we talk about the metabolism of the human body, we have to refer back to some structures within the human body, like the mitochondria, which produces the ATP needed for the energy source for our cells. During catabolic reactions of the mitochondria, about 40% of the energy is used for the production of ATP and cellular work. The other 60% escapes as heat that warms the interior of the cell and the surrounding tissues. This slide shows the sources of ATP. Cells can break down any avail available substrate from the nutrient pool to obtain energy. Nutrients are obtained through digestion, absorption, and then distributed to the body cells via the blood and interstitial fluids. Cells in most tissues absorb and catabolize glucose as their primary energy source. Remember, neural tissues require a continuous supply of glucose. So if someone was in a state of starvation, other tissues can shift to fatty acids or amino acids for fuel, thereby conserving glucose for neural tissues. Liver cells store triglycerides and glycogen reserves. If absorption by the digestive tract fails to maintain normal nutrient levels, the triglycerides and glycogen are broken down and the fatty acids and glucose are released for cells to burn. Adipocytes can convert excess fatty acids to triglycerides for storage. If absorption by the digestive tract and reserves in the liver fail to maintain normal nutrient levels, the triglycerides are broken down and the fatty acids are released for cells to burn. And skeletal muscles at rest metabolize fatty acids and use glucose to build glycogen reserves. Amino acids are used to increase the number of myofibrils. If the digestive tract, adipocytes, and liver are unable to maintain normal nutrient levels, the contractile proteins can be broken down and amino acids released into the circulation for use by other tissues. So you can see that there's many sources of ATP that can be found within the body. Some of the catabolic hormones are shown here. Cortisol, glucagon, adrenaline, and epinephrine. Cortisol is released from the adrenal gland, mostly in times of stress. And as noted, its main role is to increase blood glucose levels by breaking down fats and proteins. Glucagon is released from the alpha cells in the pancreas when the body needs to generate additional energy. And it stimulates the breakdown of glycogen in the liver to increase blood glucose levels. Adrenaline and epinephrine are released when the sympathetic nervous system is activated and can increase heart rate and heart contractility, constrict blood vessels, or bronchodilate, open up the lungs to increase the air volume, 
and stimulate gluconeogenesis. Some of the anabolic hormones are sh shown here. Growth hormone, insulin-like growth factor, insulin, testosterone, and estrogen. Growth hormone is synthesized from the, and released from the pituitary gland and has an impact on most cells of the body, particularly bones and muscle. Insulin-like growth factor stimulates the growth of muscle and bone, but also inhibits cell death. Insulin does the opposite of glucagon and is produced and released by the beta cells of the pancreas and plays an essential role in carbohydrate and fat metabolism. Testosterone and estrogen are two of the reproductive hormones. Testosterone is produced by the testes in male and the ovaries in females and can stimulate an increase in those secondary sex characteristics like muscle mass and strength in bones in men. Estrogen, produced primarily by the ovaries, but also by the liver and adrenal glands, and has a function in increasing metabolism and fat deposition. The cells of the body are able to capture energy from electrons that go from organic fuels to oxygen in the process of respiration. The movement of electrons from one molecule to another is called an oxidation reduction reaction. Redox reactions include reduction, where you have a gain of electrons, and oxidation, where you have a loss of electrons. Just like with anabolism and catabolism, oxidation and reduction reactions are typically coupled, and that's why they're called redox reactions. During cellular respiration, NAD plus and FAD plus act as coenzymes by serving as carrier molecules for hydrogen electrons. Let's examine first how carbohydrates are digested, absorbed, and metabolized. Glucose is the preferred substrate for catabolism under resting conditions. Glucose catabolism is often referred to as cellular respiration and occurs in a three-step process. Glycolysis, the citric acid cycle, which is also known as the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. And you can see here on the slide that glucose has a number of factors which makes it the preferred primary energy source for all of our cells. It's a small soluble molecule. It can provide ATP anaerobically as well as aerobically. It can be stored as glycogen and it's easily mobilized. The full enzymatic breakdown of glucose is demonstrated here. From glycolysis, all the way through the oxidative phosphorylation to produce ATP. Let's start by examining glycolysis in a little more detail. Glycolysis is an anaerobic process, meaning it does not require oxygen and occurs in the cytoplasm of body cells. A glucose molecule is oxidized into three, into two, three carbon molecules of pyruvate. During the oxidation of glucose to pyruvate, four molecules of ATP are produced by substrate level phosphorylation. However, two ATPs are required to start the oxidation process, so a net gain of two ATPs are generated through the process of glycolysis. In addition, two hydrogen electrons are transferred from the glucose molecule as it is oxidized and picked up by two coenzymes of NAD plus to form two NADH molecules. The two NADH molecules are shuttled into the mitochondria 
will, there, will be later used in the electron transport chain for ATP production. The fate of the pyruvate molecules depends on the availability of oxygen. If no oxygen is present, the pyruvate molecules will be converted to lactic acid during the anaerobic process known as lactic acid fermentation. If oxygen is available, the pyruvate will be shuttled to the mitochondria to be used in the citric acid cycle. And here you can see the difference between anaerobic versus aerobic respiration. So the fate of glucose can vary depending on whether or not oxygen is present. The citric acid cycle is the next step and is an aerobic process, meaning it requires oxygen and also occurs in the matrix of the mitochondria. The starting material of the citric acid cycle is acetyl-CoA molecules, which are formed in an intermediate step from pyruvate. As the two pyruvate molecules enter the mitochondria, a carbon dioxide is removed in a process called decarboxylation from each, which results in two two-carbon molecules of acetate. These quickly combine with the coenzyme A to form two molecules of acetyl-CoA. Meanwhile, the decarboxylation step releases a hydrogen electron that is picked up by the coenzyme NAD to produce a single NADH for each pyruvate. The NADHs will be shuttled to the electron transport chain for ATP production. The two acetyl-CoA molecules produced during the intermediate step now move through the citric acid cycle forming several keto acids. As they move through the cycle, two more decarboxylation reactions occur, producing a total of six NADH, four carbon dioxides, two FADH2, and two ATPs, all by substrate level phosphorylation. So the overall net gains from the intermediate step and the citric acid cycle are 8 NADH, 6 CO2, 2 FADH2, and 2 ATPs. The electron transport chain is an aerobic process which occurs on the cristae or folds of the mitochondria. The coenzymes NAD plus and FAD deliver the hydrogen atoms, electrons, from glycolysis and the citric acid cycle to the inner membrane of the mitochondria, called the cristae, for participation in the electron transport system. Within the cristae, there are numerous embedded proteins called cytochromes. The hydrogen electrons are passed from one cytochrome to another in a series of redox reactions. As the electrons are passed, molecules of ATP are produced by oxidative phosphorylation. Eventually, the hydrogen electrons are passed to oxygen molecules, which act as the final electron acceptors in the electron transport system and generate a total of six water molecules. The products of the electron transport system are six water molecules and 32 ATP. The 32 ATPs provide about 95% of the ATP used by body cells. So the summary of ATP production from the electron transport system is as follows. Four ATPs from the two NADHs made during glycolysis, 24 ATPs from the eight NADHs made during the intermediate step and the citric acid cycle, and four ATPs from the two FADH2s made during the citric acid cycle. And you can see here the overview that we started with. This is a summary of glucose catabolism. 
the entire process of glucose catabolism can be summarized in the following equation. Glucose C6H12O6 plus 6 oxygens 6O2 yields 6 carbon dioxides plus 6 waters plus 36 ATPs plus heat. 40% of the energy in glucose is converted to ATP, while 60% of it is converted to heat. Gluconeogenesis is the synthesis of glucose from pyruvate, lactate, glycerol, alanine, or glutamate. Glucose can be synthesized from a number of substrates as shown here. And here is the summary of carbohydrate metabolism. Now glucose catabolism is regulated by two hormones. Insulin, which is secreted by the beta cells of the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas, and lowers blood sugar levels by stimulating glycogenesis, lipogenesis, and glucose catabolism. Glucagon, secreted by the alpha cells of the islets of Langerhans in the pancreas, raises blood sugar levels by stimulating glycogenolysis and gluconeogenesis. Now let's look at lipid metabolism, digestion, and absorption. During lipid catabolism, which is also called lipolysis, lipids are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol. The glycerol unit is converted into pyruvate through the glycolysis pathway, which can yield two ATPs for each triglyceride broken down. The fatty acid units do not completely metabolize until they are absorbed into the mitochondria where an enzymatic reaction called beta-oxidation breaks off the first two carbons as acetyl-CoA while leaving a shorty fatty acid bound to the second molecule of coenzyme A. For each step in beta-oxidation, the cell gains 17 ATPs and the process is repeated until the entire fatty acid has been broken down. This process is very efficient and can produce 51 ATPs for a 6-carbon fatty acid chain. Recall only 36 ATPs can be formed from breaking down the 6-carbon molecule of glucose. And here you can see the structure of a triglyceride and how it can be broken down into a corresponding monoglyceride. Chylomicrons contain triglycerides, cholesterol molecules, and other protein molecules. These function to carry out water-insoluble molecules from the intestine through our lymphatic system and into the bloodstream and carry lipids to adipose tissue for storage. This shows the breakdown of fatty acids. Ketogenesis is shown here, and this is when acetyl-CoA is diverted from the Krebs cycle into the ketogenesis pathway. This reaction also occurs in the mitochondria and results in the production of beta-hydroxybutyrate, which is the pri primary ketone body found in the blood. Ketooxidation is shown here. And this would be appropriate when glucose is limited and ketone bodies can be oxidized to produce acetyl-CoA and then can be used to generate energy. Although lipids do provide more ATP per gram than carbohydrates, lipids are not the preferred energy source of most body cells because the process of beta-oxidation is relatively slow and therefore cannot keep up with the constant demands of all our body cells. Furthermore, lipid digestion is often incomplete 
when the body tries to perform it rapidly, which produces ketone bodies, and these can accumulate and cause a drop in blood pH called ketoacidosis or simply ketosis. Lipids can follow one of several pathways during metabolism depending on the starting substrate. You can see here the lipid metabolism of different substrates based on the starting material. Now let's examine proteins, their digestion, absorption, and metabolism. Proteins are mechanically processed and lubricated in the mouth, but no chemical digestion occurs in the oral cavity. There is, however, additional mechanical processing that occurs in the stomach through the churning and mixing of food. And in addition, the exposure of the food to the strongly acidic environment kills pathogens and breaks down connective tissues and plant cell walls. The stomach acids, in particular hydrochloric acid, secreted by the parietal cells of the stomach, denature the proteins within the foods, exposing the peptide bonds to enzymatic attack by the proteolytic enzyme pepsin, which is secreted by the chief cells as an inactive enzyme pepsinogen. However, protein digestion is not completed in the stomach because time is limited and pepsin only attacks specific types of peptide bonds. However, pepsin has enough time to break down complex proteins into smaller peptides and polypeptide chains before that chyme enters the small intestine. When acid chyme arrives in the small intestine, more specifically the duodenum, CCK produced by the brush border cells of the small intestine stimulate the release of pancreatic proteases. These enzymes are secreted as inactive proenzymes that are then activated within the duodenum. The activated proteases include trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase, and elastase. Each enzyme attacks peptide bonds linking specific amino acids and ignores others. Together, they break down proteins into mixtures of dipeptides, tripeptides, and amino acids. The brush border cells secrete enzymes that break down the remaining protein chains into individual amino acids. The amino acids are absorbed into the brush border cells by facilitated diffusion and co-transport mechanisms. After diffusing into the basal surface of the cell, the amino acids are moved into the hepatic portal vein and transported to the liver for processing. Here you can see the energy that can be obtained from various amino acids. Amino acids can be broken down into precursors for glycolysis or the Krebs cycle so they can enter the cycle through more than one pathway and can also be used as an energy source for the body. Here we can see the ureo cycle. The first step in amino acid catabolism is the removal of an amino group by deamination, leaving a carbon chain that can usually be converted to pyruvate, acetyl-CoA, or keto acids, and an ammonium ion. The ammonium ions are highly toxic, even in low concentrations. Liver cells, which is the primary site of deamination, have enzymes that use ammonium ions to synthesize urea, which is a relatively harmless, water-soluble compound that is excreted in the urine. The urea cycle is the reaction sequence responsible for the production of urea. So you can see that our nutrients can follow various pathways from ingestion 
all the way through the digestive process as they are broken down and used for energy production. Now let's examine some concepts of energetics and thermoregulation. The amount of energy needed to support ongoing activities varies from moment to moment. All of the chemical reactions that generate ATP also generate heat. When activity levels increase, ATP production accelerates and more heat is generated. Many body functions will only occur at a narrow, relatively narrow range of temperatures and metabolic pathways are at risk unless heat is lost as quickly as it is produced. So energetics, as shown here, is the study of the flow of energy and its changes from one form to another. Our basal metabolic rate is the minimum resting energy expenditure of an awake, alert person. We express the energy content of food in calories. We express the energy expended by the body due to metabolism in kilocalories or calories. Food intake is largely regulated by hormones, as you can see here, and their effects on the feeding center and the feeling of fullness of the hypothalamus. Make sure that you're familiar with the hormones that can initiate the feeding process and those that can also contribute to that feeling of fullness. During the absorptive state, the body digests foods and absorbs the nutrients as they have been enzymatically broken down through the alimentary canal into their constituent monomers and can then be transported across the cell membranes. During the post-absorptive state, the body must rely on stored energy, stored glycogen, for energy. And the liver and skeletal muscles provide a source of glycogen or energy storage for the body. Because heat is produced during metabolism, heat production and heat loss must be kept in balance despite wide variations in activity levels and environmental factors. Thermoregulation is the homeostatic control of body temperature and is regulated by a balance of heat producing mechanisms along with heat loss mechanisms. Some of the heat producing mechanisms are shown here. Vasoconstriction of the capillaries in the skin, an increase in metabolic rate, shivering, behavioral modifications, or enhanced thyroid hormone thyroxin release. At rest, most body heat is produced by the liver, brain, heart, kidneys, and endocrine organs. Activation of skeletal muscles causes dramatic increases in body heat production. The body core generally has the highest temperature, whereas the skin has the lowest temp. Blood serves as the major heat exchange agent between the core of the body and the skin. When blood is deep in the organs, heat loss from the skin is minimal. When blood is in the skin capillaries, heat loss is at its maximum. There are several heat loss mechanisms that are shown here. Radiation, which is the loss of heat in the form of infrared waves or thermal energy. Evaporation, where heat is absorbed by water molecules that become so energized that they escape as water vapor is taking heat with it. Convection, which is when the skin transfers heat to the air that overlies the skin of the body, 
causing the movement of air molecules, remember hot air rises, and conduction, which is the transfer of heat between objects that are in direct contact with one another. Other additional heat loss mechanisms include sweating, vasodilation of capillaries in the skin, and behavioral modifications. The hypothalamus acts as the body's thermostat. Its heat promoting center and heat loss center receive input from the peripheral and central thermoreceptors and integrate these inputs by also initiating and also initiating responses that lead to the homeostasis of the body. The effects of a failure to control body temperature can result in disorientation, loss of muscle control, loss of consciousness, convulsions, cardiac arrest, protein denaturation, coma, or even death. Now let's examine nutrition and diet. First, let's look at vitamins. Vitamins are organic compounds required in very small amounts, but they play an essential role in specific metabolic pathways. Vitamins are easily destroyed when exposed to cooking temperatures and therefore are best obtained from recently harvested fresh fruits and vegetables. There are two groups of vitamins, fat-soluble and water-soluble vitamins. And remember, vitamins yield no energy. The water-soluble vitamins are shown here. Water-soluble vitamins are the various B vitamins and vitamin C. Most of them are components of coenzymes. The B vitamins are rapidly exchanged between the fluid compartments of the digestive tract and circulating blood, and excessive amounts are readily excreted in the urine. The table summarizes the water-soluble vitamins. Fat-soluble vitamins consist of vitamins A, D, E, and K. Fat-soluble vitamins are absorbed primarily from the digestive tract, along with the lipid contents of my cells. Most fat-soluble vitamins are produced by our foods, but exposure of our skin to sunlight can produce small amounts of vitamin D, and the intestinal bacteria produce some vitamin K. The following table summarizes the fat-soluble vitamins. Minerals are inorganic compounds required in very small amounts, but like vitamins, are essential for normal cellular processes and body functions. Minerals are not damaged or destroyed during the cooking process and are easily obtained in a varied diet. Minerals are classified into two categories, major minerals and trace minerals, and minerals also yield no energy. The following tables outline the major minerals and trace minerals. The major minerals are needed in amounts greater than 100 milligrams per day. The major minerals include calcium, phosphorus, potassium, sulfur, sodium, chloride, and magnesium. Trace minerals are needed in amounts less than 100 milligrams per day. The trace minerals include iron, fluorine, manganese, copper, iodide, selenium, cobalt, zinc, and chromium.
Liver cells and other body cells can readily synthesize the carbon frameworks of roughly half of the amino acids needed to synthesize proteins. There are 10 amino acids, however, that body cells cannot synthesize or cannot be produced in amounts sufficient for growing children. These are therefore considered essential amino acids and must be included in the diet. In an animation reaction, an ammonium ion is used to form an amino acid that is attached to a carbon molecule yielding an amino acid. In a transamination, the amino acid group of one amino acid is transferred to another molecule yielding a different amino acid. So there are two reactions outlined how different amino acids can be produced. The essential amino acids that must be consumed are listed here for you, and the essential amino acids that are anabolized by the body are also listed here. Finally, proper nutrition is important to the functioning of a normal healthy body. The MyPlate website is shown here and is a great resource and is provided by the U.S. Department of Agriculture and has guidelines on how you can maintain a healthy diet. So make sure you're familiar with the three eating disorders and the metabolic disorders that we discussed.